Welcome genre fans! In this episode, we will be exploring one of the major collaborators who contributed to the genre, or Fione in Italian, called Giallo, Mario Bava. While we are dividing these next videos up by director, we do recognize the challenges and limitations of our tour theory. Directors frequently receive all credit for their films when in fact it is a collaborative medium, involving dozens to thousands of cast and crew members to make each film. This era of Italian filmmaking was on a tight enough timeline with movies taking as little as four weeks to shoot and directors credited for multiple films per year that we do believe Giallo directors had a higher impact on each movie. But dividing discussion up by director remains a shortcut and we acknowledge and will endeavor to include the work of collaborators such as writers, composers, cinematographers, editors, actors, etc. More than just a director, Mario Bava was an accomplished painter, cinematographer, special and optical effects artist, screenwriter, and editor. In his own words, movies are a magician's forge. They allow you to build a story with your hands. At least, that's what it means to me. What attracts me in movies is to be presented with a problem and be able to solve it. Nothing else, just to create an illusion, an effect, with almost nothing. Considered the grandfather of Giallo, Mario Bava inaugurated the genre with back-to-back -back films. In 1963, The Girl Who Knew Too Much, known internationally as The Evil Eye, and a segment in Black Sabbath called Il Telefono, or in English, The Telephone, as well as Blood and Black Lace the following year. In these formative Gialli, we see the emergence of the figures and tropes that we most associate with the genre, as well as Bava's own visually sumptuous aesthetic for murder. You can view our video on what makes a Giallo, Lincoln cards. With his later Gialli in the 70s, Five Dolls for an August Moon, A Bay of Blood, and Hatchet for the Honeymoon, he subverted the genre rules he himself had set and paved the way for genre films in the decades to come. Mario Bava was born into a filmmaking family on July 31st, 1914 in San Remo, Italy, only one day after the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand and the start of World War I. He trained in the fine arts as a painter and decided to pursue filmmaking only when he could not produce enough paintings to sustainably live. His father, Eugenio Bava, was a cinematographer and special effects pioneer whose film career began in 1906. In 1910, Eugenio got work at Pefe Frere as a set designer, where he mastered in-camera special effects. His resume is pretty impressive, working as a cinematographer on huge silent epics like Quo Vadis, or assisting in the Mount Vesuvius eruption scene in Cabiria. He had a brief stint directing films in Rome before taking the post of Director of Optical Effects at Instituto Luce in 1926 during Mussolini's fascist reign. Mario worked for several years as his father's assistant, subtitling feature films for export and animation animating title sequences for Italian features until the late 1930s, when he realized he needed to advance in his career to support his growing family. Like Mario, Eugenio was originally trained in the fine arts world, though as a sculptor, and he applied this training to special effects and cinematography, considering film more as a profession than a calling. Mario Bava had the early advantage of working with other important Italian filmmakers. He was an assistant to famed cinematographer Massimo Terzano, who, like Eugenio Bava, started in the silent period and continued on through the fascist period. Bava was an uncredited assistant cameraman on La Nave Bianca, the first in Rossellini's informal fascist trilogy. Some other notable films he worked on in this period include Captain Tempest, The Lion of Damascus, and The Barber of Seville. Through the 40s and 50s, Bava's camera work helped to establish on-screen stars such as Steve Reeves, Aldo Fabrizi, and Gino Lalla Brigida. Bava used his background as a painter in creating special effects such as matte paintings and composite shots during the 40s and 50s. See here his glass background painting for Nero's Mistress. He would use mats in several films, most notably in his 1970 whodunit giallo, Five Dolls for an August Moon. Peplum, Sword and Sorcery, and sci-fi films all provided ample opportunity for Bava to work as a cinematographer and special effects artist. Many credit Bava's work on the Kirk Douglas Peplum epic Ulysses and the Steve Reeves vehicle Hercules with sparking the sword and sandal Fione. Bava co-directed the first Italian sci-fi film, The Day the Sky Exploded, even though Paolo Hoish got sole directorial credit.
One of Baba's most defining characteristics is his inventiveness, producing brilliant compositions and effects from scraps and simple techniques under high constraints. He recounted, On Planet of the Vampires, I had nothing, literally. There was only an empty soundstage, really squalid because we had no money. And this had to look like an alien planet. What did I do then? I took a couple of paper mache rocks from the nearby studio, probably leftovers from some sword and sandal flick. Then I put them in the middle of the set and covered the ground with smoke and dry ice and darken the background. Then I shifted these two rocks here and there, and this way I shot the whole film. The 1957 film E Vampiri would be significant for Italian horror in general, and Bava in particular. Horror films had lain dormant since the silent period. After rising to power in the 20s, Mussolini quickly banned the production and exhibition of horror films. See our previous video on the socio-historical context of the Italian Fione, linked in cards above. There wouldn't be another domestic horror production until E Vampiri over a decade after World War II had ended. By this point, Bava had the reputation of being able to make incredibly expressive images on a shoestring budget. The director, his friend Ricardo Freda, hired him on for lighting and special effects, but quit the film over a dispute with producers after only two days of filming, leaving Bava to complete it as an uncredited director. This pattern of being hired for cinematography and special effects, then effectively rescuing films by completing them in the capacity of director, would be repeated in the 50s and throughout the rest of Bava's career. In 1959 alone, he stepped in to complete Jack Turner's The Giant and Marathon and finish Ricardo Freitas' Caltiki the Immortal Monster. It was Bava's ability to shoot with extreme economy at a rapid pace that led him to receive the opportunity from grateful producers to direct his first film in 1960. Black Sunday was a landmark gothic horror film with arched black and white mise-en-scene, torture implements, branding, spiked masks, a collection of German expressionism and Hollywood horror tropes reinvented. More than Eve Ampieri, Black Sunday ushered in the era of modern Italian horror. We've linked 100 years of cinema's analysis below if if you want to learn more. Although Black Sunday is not a giallo, it laid the groundwork and set the themes of Baba's directorial filmography. For example, seminal giallo Blood and Black Lace also features dazzling set pieces, Baroque visual design, and heightened subjective scenes of women suffering and being killed. In addition to horror and simultaneously with Jolly, Baba continued in other wide-ranging genre work. Fantasy action with Eric the Conqueror, sci-fi with Planet of the Vampires, spaghetti westerns such as The Road to Fort Alamo or Roy Colt and Winchester Jack, comedy with Dr. Goldfoot and the Girl Bombs. This wicked scientist made girls. or four times that night, neo-noir with rabid dogs. And of course, the Black Sunday style gothic tinged horror Bava is most known for. The Whip in the Body, Black Sabbath, Kill Baby, Kill, Barren Blood, and Shock. But let's get into Mario Bava's Jallo films. In The Girl Who Knew Too Much, American Nora Davis, an avid reader of mystery novels, is visiting her aunt in Rome. When her aunt dies suddenly, Nora herself is embroiled in a murder mystery, and she investigates with handsome doctor Marcello Basi to solve the crimes. Mario Bava not only directed, but is credited for director of photography and screenplay, along with main writer Ennio Di Concini, who he had worked with previously on Black Sunday, Eliana Di Sabata, Sergio Corbucci, Mino Guerrero, and Franco Prosperi. The Girl Who Knew Too Much is considered by many to be the first giallo, building on American abroad thrillers such as Alfred Hitchcock's The Man Who Knew Too Much. Like Hitchcock, Bava made a cameo as the leering portrait of Nora's uncle Augusto, and this appearance in turn inspired director Michele Suave to include a similar scene in Euro horror classic Della Morte Della More. Since The Girl Who Knew Too Much was filmed in black and white, it has a noir feel and its German crimi film lineage is evident. It introduced some key giallo tropes. In addition to featuring a protagonist in a foreign country, the girl who knew too much had an ordinary person becoming involved in solving a series of murders while they are imperiled by a shadowy killer. This film directly influenced Dario Argento in The Bird with the Crystal Plumage. The two films share the trope of what the protagonist saw versus what they missed or imagined. This became common in Gialli, a protagonist doubting or misremembering their own experience. Argento used this again in Deep Red. 
Giallo filmmakers also use the blueprint Bob established here of the protagonist confronting a killer at the edge of their rope in the climactic scene. Even the reveal of the killer being a disturbed woman is a Giallo element. Laura is an edgy, neurotic maniac in her penultimate confrontation with Nora. However, some giallo elements, including a focus on the more sordid aspects of murders, sexuality, and drug use, were softened, particularly in the American International Pictures edit intended for a more juvenile audience. It lacks that late mid-century sleaze. As Troy Howarth writes, more than anything else, The Girl Who Knew Too Much is a seminal film, one that would pave the way for bigger and better things. The first segment in the 1963 horror anthology Black Sabbath is a snack-sized giallo called The Telephone, based loosely on the 1887 short story La Horla by Guy de Maupassant. It has a beautiful woman, Rosie, being menaced in her apartment by a lewd caller who threatens to exact his revenge by killing her. This is a remarkable premise over 10 years before Black Christmas set the standard for obscene phone calls in horror movies in 1974. The telephone has a few notable giallo elements. There is a hint of the mid-century sleaze from the style of Rosie's apartment and the fashionable clothing she and her ex-girlfriend Mary wear. The tale itself is a thriller, which ends with two of three characters murdered. These characters are linked to each other via sex. Rosie is a sex worker, Mary is her former lover, and Frank is her incarcerated pimp. The obscene, threatening phone calls give us a conflation of sexual desire with murderous intent, where in reality Reality vengeance is the killer's motive. There are also a few visual touches establishing imagery that Bava and other filmmakers would use in subsequent gialli. For example, Mary's gloved hand clutching a knife echoes the design of later giallo killers, and the camera moves in Frank's POV as he kills Mary. The telephone calls themselves are a red herring as much as they are a supernatural ill omen foreshadowing the end. We, the audience, were meant to believe it is Frank taking revenge on Rosie who had turned him into the police, but they are actually Mary's subterfuge to reconnect with Rosie. In the Italian edit, at least, Mary is a lesbian and is punished for this transgression in a prolonged sexualized killing. Blood and Black Lace builds on the murder mystery elements from The Girl Who Knew Too Much and the mid-century sleaziness of the telephone segment of Black Sabbath to be a genre-defining giallo. Centered on a Roman fashion house owned by Countess Christiana Como and managed by Massimo Morlocchi, this film oozes glamour under an air of paranoia and looming violence. Models are murdered one by one by a mysterious killer after the disappearance of a diary containing secrets. The imagery in Blood and Black Lace is both beautiful and unsettling, particularly the color and framing. Our introduction to the fashion house shows a lurid space populated with purple, green, and red mannequins, ornate walls, and Baroque and antique Rococo set dressings. A green light flashes when model Nicole anxiously wanders through an antique shop, which heightens the mood of subjected terror and evokes Hitchcock's vertigo. These vivid images laid the groundwork for the wildly stylish Jolly of the 60s and 70s. This film demonstrates Bava's eye for composition and shows cinematographer Ubaldo Terzano's skill. Terzano had previously collaborated with Bava on beautifully shot gothic horror films Black Sabbath and The Whip in the Body. Notably, Blood and Black Lace shifts from classic murder mystery elements to emphasize the killings themselves in stylized, fetishistic murder set pieces. Terzano's camera work brings the audience in and makes us complicit. <laughs> However, it's not a particularly bloody film. While the murders are inventive, the color red stands in place of overt gore, and in the case of Massimo, reveals him to be one of the killers. 
The killer design introduces a giallo hallmark with its black gloves, trench coat, hat, and mask that obscure both the identity and the gender of the murderer. We see variations on this design in later films, but this original is iconic. The killer appears a sadist in nature, subjecting each victim to prolonged, sexualized scenes of torture, which often aim to obliterate the beauty of the victim. We see this in the first killing of Isabella, where the killer strangles her and slams her against a tree, smearing her lipstick and slashing her face. As he drags her away, Isabella's skirt hikes up and her cleavage is exposed. The killer rips second victim's Nicole's dress to expose her bra before killing her with a spiked glove and toppling a suit of armor on her corpse to evoke a sex act. The killer interrogates the next victim, Peggy, torturing her by burning her hands and face with a hot furnace. In the world of Gialli, torture generally can be seen as a displacement of sexual rage. The killer smothers the next victim, Greta, who has just found Peggy's corpse in her trunk, before posing both Greta and Peggy's bodies to be found by the police. The final victim before killers Massimo and Christiana turn on each other is Tao Li, who is in her underwear as she is slowly drowned by the killer. The ultimate reveal of the killers set another giallo standard. There are two killers. One killer is both traumatized and a woman, and the motive appears to be sexual, but is actually greed. Bava often turned to characters like Christiana, who are undone by a single fatal flaw. In this case, loving a morally bankrupt man like Massimo, who ultimately wants her dead so he can take over her business and steal her money. However, other giallo took the twist of multiple killers, killers who turn on each other, a woman being the killer, or sexualized killings hiding the true motive. Blood and Black Lace is the first full-blooded giallo, and its remorseless cruelty and embittered cynicism mark it as a film that was very much ahead of its time. All filmmakers who have dabbled in the Italian thriller genre have been influenced by Bava's first brave attempts. Hatchet for the Honeymoon is a 1970 film centering on John Harrington, an apparently successful bridal designer in Paris. He is also a serial killer who murders brides to recover repressed childhood memories of his mother's murder. The mystery centers on what really happened to his mother, and whether love interest Helen will discover he has killed his wife Mildred and five other women in time to save herself. This is the first time Bava featured extensive subjective camera work, otherwise known as killer POV, starting from the beginning scene where John stalks and kills bride and groom on their wedding night. The audience spends the entirety of the film identifying with the protagonist as he murders women on his journey of self-discovery, a cynical reflection of the me generation. This focus on a killer's psychology, and in particular past trauma, is a key giallo element. John keeps his suffering close and hidden. He disposes of the bodies of the brides he murders in his hothouse and perfectly preserves remnants of his youth in his boyhood room. This emphasis on objects from a killer's traumatic childhood would be used by directors like Dario Argento in Deep Red. Since John is impotent, violence is substitute for sexual intimacy and release. For him, the wedding dress is fetish, and the killing is orgasm. All the killings in this giallo are inherently sexualized. Thematically, Hatchet for the Honeymoon is more bava than giallo. It deals with the falseness of surface appearances. John wears material success and wealth like a proto-Patrick Bateman from American Psycho. Both tend to their physical appearance and external markings of wealth, while their facades conceal callous murderers. Filmed in Spain in the mansion of then reigning Spanish dictator Generalissimo Francisco Franco, the film can serve as an allegory for the amoral rich leeching off normal people. John is not a self-made man, despite his appearance. The fashion house is his mother's, and his wife Mildred funds his business and lifestyle. He appears to be a playboy, but is impotent. Mildred is more of a mother than wife to him since they've never consummated their marriage. The lack of mystery and added supernatural elements eclipse many present giallo tropes. John is frank about the fact that he has killed women in voiceover from the start. The fact is, I am completely mad. The realization of which annoyed me at first. And once John murders Mildred, she haunts him for the remainder of the film. First, others can see Mildred when John sees only her ashes. Then John sees Mildred when no one else can.
Mario Bava's least favorite film of his prolific career, Five Dolls for an August Moon, is more a ripoff of Agatha Christie's Who Done It and Then There Were None than a definitive giallo. Wealthy industrialist George Stark invites his business partners and their wives for a holiday on his private island with the hidden motive of pressuring Professor Farrell to sell his industrial resin formula worth millions. When the guests start being killed one by one, the audience is left to figure out who the killer is. This film has that classic giallo late mid-century style. The exterior shots of the modernist mansion are actually a matte painting created by Mario Bava. The interior has a ton of great period features, from a conversation pit to a spiral staircase to a rotating bed. The bar is stocked with J&B whiskey. Bava filmed the interior scenes in a beach house over the course of 19 days, making it one of his shortest shoots. Beyond the twisty murder mystery plot and mid-century fabulousness, there is not much to mark Five Dolls for an August Moon a giallo. The focus remains on discovery of the bodies rather than the act of killing itself. Thematically, the film does include topics Bava frequently explores, surface appearances being deceiving and amoral characters with greed as their motive. Professor Farrell, as we find out in the end, stole the formula from his brilliant colleague. He's not the genius he pretends to be and is just as materialistic as everyone else. He confesses under sodium pentothal, not because he's interested in the truth. Trudy is cold-blooded, calculated, and arrogant. Her face a mask concealing pure rapaciousness. Isabel, who walks away with the formula and all the money, sees an opportunity to get rich and simply waits for everyone to kill each other. Every character is ultimately motivated by pure avarice. Five Dolls for an August Moon also shows Baba's sardonic side. As each member of the party is killed, the remaining characters put the corpses in a freezer while a Western player piano motif plays on the soundtrack. These scenes emphasize death as an equalizer. Humans are all just meat and will die one day regardless of class. The only other significant change that Baba made was the ending. Isabel visiting the professor on death row to get the bank code after spending two of the three million dollars is a twist of the night that cynical viewers will appreciate. Thank you. Don't worry, my love, I'll pray for you. For Bava, Five Dolls for an August Moon was a pot boiler, a quickly made film of dubious quality that nonetheless paid. The budget was so low that the majority of actors were instructed to wear their own costumes to set. Budgetary constraints also landed Bava the only editing role in his filmography, which explains the use of disorienting cuts rather than optical dissolves. A Bay of Blood, also known as Twitch of the Death Nerve, is a ruthless, gory film presaging horror movies in the slasher subgenre. Count Filippo Donati murders his wheelchair-bound wife, the Countess Frederica, and stages it as a suicide. Immediately, a mysterious figure kills the Count and drags him away. A greedy cast of heirs and interested parties descends on the Countess's bayside property to try and take ownership by any means necessary, even murder. Bava and screenwriter Dardano Sacchetti's initial story was just 13 separate murder set pieces that needed to be connected into a cohesive narrative. These killings are stylized in true giallo fashion, with a variety of weapons in an atmosphere of heightened violence, and many prominently include killer POV. First, we have the Count hanging the Countess. Then, the Count is stabbed with a knife. Four teens who show up to have a morbid party die one by one in creative ways. A bill hook for Brunhilde. And Bobby. Followed by the famous spear stab through the other two while they have sex. The Count's estranged daughter Rennie stabs real estate developer Frank in the femoral artery after discovering the teen's bodies in a pile. Rennie's husband Albert kills local entomologist Paolo Fassati because he witnessed the scene of violence between Rennie and Frank. Rennie decapitates Fassati's snooping wife Anna with a hatchet. The Countess's illegitimate son Simon strangles Frank's secretary, who is also the Count's former lover, Laura, after she throws hot water in his face. Albert kills Simon with a spear against the wall of his shack. 
Albert kills Frank with a knife during a struggle in Frank's darkened cabin. Finally, Albert and Rennie's kids, believing the gun is a toy, shoot their parents. A Bay of Blood helped define the slasher genre that would flourish in the 80s. The Friday the 13th franchise lifted kill scenes directly. Carlo Rambaldi, the special effects maestro who had worked with Bava previously on Planet of the Vampires, helped to create the signature gore effects by taking casts of the actors' heads and rigging them up with blood for maximum splatter. Rambaldi had wide influence in many Fione, especially the Pepla, and notably made the controversial vivisected dogs in Lucio Fulci's Giallo, A Lizard in a Woman's Skin. <laughs> <laughs> and the creepy doll in Dario Argento's Deep Red. He would go on to win three Oscars for Alien, E.T., and King Kong, for which Mario Bava recommended him to Dino De Laurentiis, as Bava himself did not want to travel to the U.S. The production itself was typically low budget, with Bava once again acting as director and cinematographer and doing special effects such as creating the illusion of a forest at the shooting location of producer Giuseppe Zacchiarello's beach house with tree branches. Notoriously, Bava used a child's red wagon for tracking shots. Mario Bava inspired directors as varied as John Carpenter in Halloween, Martin Scorsese in Cape Fear, and Pedro Almodovar in Matador. More directly, his disciple Dario Argento perfected Giallo by putting his own spin on Bava's tropes, especially killer design and brutal sexualized killings. Mario Bava's son, Lamberto Bava, would become a third-generation director after working with his father as an assistant director from 1965 until his first directorial credit for Macabre in 1980. Mario Bava was a visionary filmmaker with a high level of technical proficiency who pioneered the Giallo Fione by translating his essentially sardonic and morbid worldview into pulpy stories of murder. And that's our discussion of Mario Bava's contributions to Giallo. Remember to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and select all so you can know first thing when we post a new video. Don't forget to let your film nerd friends know about our channel. Thanks, and see you soon. Mm -hmm.